started the recording. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, Council and uh, members of the public, and welcome to the regular meeting of Midland Council, Wednesday, October the 18th, 2021. This meeting is being held virtually, but you can uh, view it on live streaming or on Rogers Cable 53. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor Ross sends his regrets. He's on vacation with his kids, uh, or his kids are on vacation with him. I'm not sure who took who where, but I'm sure they're having fun. Um, I'll call this meeting to order and um, I'd like to read the land acknowledgement, which is the town of Midland recognizes that it is located on land, which is the traditional treaty territory of the Anishinaabeg people, now known as the Chippewa Tri-Council, comprised of Bosley First Nation, Rama First Nation, and the Georgina Island First Nation. This territory is within the pre-Confederation Treaty 5 and Treaty 16 and included within the Williams Treaties of 1923. The town of Midland recognizes that it is located on the land which is the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and the historic homelands of the Métis, and that our town is home to a large and diverse community of Indigenous peoples. Um, at this point, I'd ask you to join me in a moment of silent reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask if there are any declarations of conflict of interest. Seeing none, none rather. I have um, a motion moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Downer that the contents of the regular council agenda for August the 18th, 2021 be approved. Uh, comments or questions on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. I uh, saying against, so that's carried. Thank you. Um, next, we have the uh, consent agenda, which um, consists of as the uh, there's some correspondence from the library asking to set up uh, some mini library uh, throughout the um, little free library boxes within the town with help from the town. Council minutes uh, for adoption from the 16th of June regular meeting and the 15th of July special meeting. CIP or council information packages from the for the period June 7th through to July 30th. And uh, three reports, the first uh, municipal asset management funding support, it's a request for funding for from senior levels of government for funding, asset management. Uh, investing in Canada infrastructure program Greenstream, which is a request for funding for um, uh, a waterworks uh, project in the amount of $3 million. And then there is a petition, uh, a, a war drain, or the Columbus award drain, and it's basically is asking for a reevaluation of uh, costs from a couple of individuals to a broader base. So that's a process that, uh, if approved, I suspect we'll approve it. Uh, we'll re-examine the whole, uh, this whole purpose of this, this drain, given that it's um, over 100 years old. So the motion is for, uh, moved by Councilor Olszewski, seconded by Councilor Prost, that the items and related recommendation, recommendations contained within the August 18th, 2021 agenda as consent items having been considered by Council uh, be approved. Are there any comments or anything that anybody would like to speak to on the consent agenda? Mr. Gore. Thanks. Just a quick one on the correspondence for consideration. And I don't think that's getting pulled out anywhere else. But for the people following along, it's a letter from the Midland Public Library requesting permission to install little free libraries in Midland Parks, which is such a neat novel idea. Some of you may have already experienced these you know, in front of a few residences around town. Um, yep. <laughs> and there's even a, a, a novel idea, too, where there's some of these boxes have food in them as well. But uh, clearly, I mean, we haven't pulled this. There's not going to be any debate on it other than, uh, you know, a silent support. 
and I wish them luck in this and it's a great initiative and it's just another one of those wonderful things that comes out of our uh, our local library that serves people in so many ways. So just a quick shout out to them for their creativity and I do look forward uh, to seeing those little pop-ups in our in our parks and being well used in the community. I think uh, I got no Councilor Shevsky has one out at the end of his driveway. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was just showing it on the screen. Great idea. Just points to the continued innovation at the library and supporting the community in various and diverse ways. So I'll set Councilor Gordon. Um, if there are no further comments or questions, then I'll call the motion. All those in favor? Thank you. That carries. So next I have a motion moved by Councilor McGinn, seconded by Councilor Maine, that Council resolve in the Committee of the Whole. Um, Council, you've heard that motion. Any comments or questions or any re, uh, uh, from anybody respecting that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you. Uh, we are now uh, resolved in the Committee of the Whole. Deputy Mayor is not here, so I will my way, through, my way through this. Um, there are no presentations. Uh, there is a deputation uh, speaking to an uh, alternative to Rainbow Crosswalk, uh, Mr. Colin Nelthorpe of PRT Simcoe Pride. Uh, is going to speak to council on um, their take on the Midland Pride cro Crosswalk. Um, Mr. Neil Thorpe here, there he is. How are you? Welcome. I'm good, Mr. Mayor, and you? I'm, uh, I'm hot. Actually, it's kind of hot in here, but other than that, great, thank you. Um, so rules of the road are basically, you have 10 minutes uh, to uh, make your presentation, and we ask that you make, make yourself available to council for questions should, should there, or suggestions should there be any. And with that, um, I guess we can, uh, we can proceed. The floor is yours. All right, thank you. Good evening, members of council. Tonight, Ferte Cinco Pride will be speaking to you on the ongoing project of a pride crosswalk in the town of Midland, as well as other ways the town can support the 2S LGBTQ plus community. FSP would also be happy to see additional funds allocated, whether by the town or through fundraising efforts to other installations, perhaps a mural, sculpture, or other public art piece that facilitates and celebrates pride. That being said, FSP would like to see the crosswalk move ahead and hopefully be installed by pride of next summer. With the rejuvenation of downtown Midland and the completion of the big dig, the crosswalk is not only an opportunity to add that the community, add that to the community project, but also create a permanent display of support for the 2S LGBTQ plus community. The crosswalk is an important starting place like the pride flag raisings were not so long ago, a conversation starter for the whole community. I'll be the first to admit that is likely a crosswalk will be vandalized as we have seen elsewhere. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it as we must not back down or give in to hate. A crosswalk will last several years with the proper care and be as strong as we are as a community. If the crosswalk is found uh, in front of the Grounded Coffee or in front of the Midland Cultural Center, both places have actively supported pride and created spaces for community, especially within uh, especially with an updated design to the pride flag, which includes the black and brown stripes to represent indigenous, black and, radic and racialized 2S LGBTQ communities, as well as the trans flag. Uh, I think it would be something to celebrate as it reflects the intersectional community. We also wanna take this opportunity to expand on the ways the town can support the community. FSP would like to see the town of Midland participate in organized assessment and professional development workspaces, uh, workshops to create a more inclusive program and the workspace for the 2S LGBTQ community. The Gilbert Center, located in Barrie and serves Simcoe Muskoka, has a safer, space, a safer space program that could do just that. Midland could also implement bylaws to ban so-called conversion therapy. This is a practice which attempts to change someone's sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. With a snap federal election dissolving parliament and yet again ending the act to ban conversion therapy. This is uh, Bill C-6. This is especially important now. Other municipalities have done this, including Kingston, Regina, and Calgary. All level of governments have a responsibility to fight this harmful practice. 
Pride is a political and intersectional movement. So our final suggestion to deal with is the intersection between the indigenous community and the Tuas LGBTQ community. The town should pass a motion regarding the truth and reconciliation call to arms, uh, calls to action and implement calls 43, 47 and 45, all of which deal specifically with municipal government. Midland should also use its platform to raise awareness and spark conversation on the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Tuas, and Tuas spirit people. To close, I and Ferte Simcoe Pride want to thank the town of Midland for the continued support of the Pride community, and we are looking forward to working with you and seeing continued action and support. Hopefully, by next summer, there will be an unveiling of a crosswalk or other Pride art installation. Okay, Mr. Nilthorpe, no, no any questions or comments uh, regarding, uh, I see Councillor uh, Cunningham, I see Councillor Gordon, Councillor Cunningham. Yes, thanks so much for bringing this to us, Colin. What a, a great presentation. And I want to say I'm glad that um, you see moving forward with the crosswalk, knowing that, yes, it may be vandalized. One of the nice things is I can fix a straight line of paint. <laughs> it's one of those things that is mm -hmm. fixable. Um, the other thing I was wondering about, I love the idea of bringing in some culturally appropriate training, and that's something that the Cultural Alliance is really focused on bringing to our whole region. Again, the strength in numbers and being able to make things a little more affordable that way. Um, have you reached out to our Cultural Alliance? And if not, let's get you connected to see about while we're seeking other cultural sensitivity training, making sure that we have a robust uh, presentation to bring to our communities. Thanks for bringing this out to us. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, no, I have not reached out to them yet. We'll get you connected. All right. Councilor Gordon. Here Thanks for coming tonight, Colin. I appreciate it. Um, just for some background here and the motion that I have uh, later on in the agenda, I reached out to, uh, to Colin basically to introduce myself because he's the new um, face of Simcoe, Fierte Simcoe Pride. And, you know, I'd been reading in the newspaper almost weekly about Pride installations uh, that are proudly unveiled and then, you know, in short order, defaced. Uh, typically with, uh, you know, people doing burnouts on them or in some cases uh, applying paint or other things. Clearly, these are just ignorant, hate-based, um, you know, acts by individuals, but they have a significant expense associated with them. Uh, originally, when this motion came up a couple of years ago for our our crosswalk, um, you know, it was estimated it would be maybe four or $5,000 tops to put one in. And it turns out upon further review and costing and sourcing the sort of rubber paint that has to be used, we got a quotes of around 16,000 to put it in. So that was one of the reasons why I reached out to you to say, hey, listen, you know, if, if we were looking, if hypothetically, because we have approved it, if we were looking hypothetically at, you know, walking this back and finding a different way to support you, what could that look like? And would you, would your organization and, you know, through you, your membership be offended by us, you know, revisiting this? And, uh, you know, I was completely ready for anything, you know, uh, and certainly willing to abandon the, the thought of abandoning this until you got back to me with that letter. And uh, it was a really super receptive conversation. And then tonight, uh, this deputation really, you know, nails it home to me that there isn't really a desire to make this an either or, um, that it really, we should stick to our guns on the crosswalk. Um, we've approved it already a couple of years ago. And that you're asking for um, even other ways that we can show some inclusivity and support in our community. Uh, some nice passive simple ways and you've made some great suggestions, all of which I think are wonderful, including some of those resolutions that I weren't I wasn't aware that we as a municipality could pass so I wanted to thank you for bringing that up to my attention because I had no idea. And I don't know if that anyone in this council would have problems with, uh, you know, affirming those and, and hoping to lead by example. So long story short here this is supposed to be a question and it's more of a statement thanks for coming tonight um a sort of reaffirming what you've shared with me and also you know telling me quite clearly that uh from your organization's perspective and the people you serve uh, that a crosswalk is still uh wanted warranted and that you know the unfortunately the inevitable defacement of it that's likely to happen um you know that's just something that we're going to live with and uh 
we'll deal with and not to back down to eight. So thank you very much. I'll, by the way, I won't be voting for my own motion later tonight. So, or I won't be voting, you know, in favor of it. I may change your mind, but we'll see. Um, with an amended motion. Um, so I have Councillor Main, I believe, and then I have Councillor McGinn. Uh, thank you, yeah. Well, I'm very happy to hear Councillor Gordon is uh, perhaps rethinking uh, pulling the plug on the Rainbow Cross. I'm very supportive of that. It's the least we can do, and it's a very simple thing that's been effective in other communities. Yeah, and I think the concern about uh, worrying about vandals, uh, that's not a concern that we have with other public art installations. We haven't had issues with our murals, our public art that we've installed. And maybe it's a good point to let the community know uh, if you vandalize a rainbow crosswalk, it's probably considered a hate crime. I think that's probably a good thing to let people know. And if you do see a rainbow crosswalk and want to deface it, seek help. Um, I mean, that's the nicest way of saying it. Um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to ask Colin about was we have uh, some amazing um, gay community members who have been talking about the BIA and the town perhaps looking at uh, maybe a Pride Street Festival or even a parade. And I just wanted to ask uh, if those have been successful in other communities, because I think, uh, especially Jay Crouch, who, as everyone knows, Splash Entertainment, he makes a big splash wherever he goes. Uh, this is an idea that I think we're really warming to, and I think that the time is right. Uh, we've got a great King Street to do it, and we have a great organization that we would love to work with and collaborate with you on that. So, Colin, uh, any positive thoughts about Pride Parades and how they're all awesome? Funny enough, FSP a few years ago did a community consultation where we realized that a lot of community members would prefer a pride festival over a pride parade, which we've, FSP has hosted a pride festival in Barrie a few years ago, I believe it was 2019, and it was very well received and well attended. Uh, Council again. Well, I, I look forward to following up with you on that one then. Thank you so much. Councillor Main, uh, Councillor McGinn. Uh, so I want to say thank you, Miigwech, for your presentation. And I appreciate I appreciate the language that is using, used. Um, I appreciate how this looks moving forward. And welcome to the deputation. I appreciate your coming. So, um, you know, doing a deputation is not always easy. And I think you did fantastically well. Uh, we, I believe, um, it, so I guess it would have been almost two and a half years ago, uh, one of the things that was brought up was that in our language that we were going to use uh, culturally sensitive um, and uh, emotionally intelligent language. And I know that the council that I sat, sat with was very responsive to that. So I have to thank my fellow councilors for being respons responsive to that. Um, Trauma-informed language and care is also something that I believe um, we ought to be in touch with because there is a lot of trauma that historically has happened and um, there can be almost a re-victimization when we stand in our truth and I am saying we because I am not a cisgender woman, woman and I've said it before neither are members of my family um, so thank you for being here um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you would have a have an interest in, um, in being a part of a part of moving forward with gathering the resources together and having it available, openly available to members of our community uh, so that there can be trauma-informed care and trauma-informed language so that we as a community can, and as a council can support and have the things that are in place. Um, I wanted to speak to what was previously said. Yes, it is considered a hate crime. Um, so I agree also with making sure that that information goes out, that it, um, it is an affront. It is a front of human rights. Um, it, is a, it is an affront of basic rights um, that are not also under the, um, under the code. And it's nice to hear my fellow counselors talking about this because we need inclusion. We need to accept each other and inclusion and support and thank you for asking. So the direct question as I am supposed to have one is um, are you interested in being involved in trauma-informed language and care and ensuring that 
we as a community and I as a counselor are, in, are having the resources readily available and else, and then after the question, yes, I came to Barry and it was absolutely amazing. And it's on my Facebook and I came with a woman who, um, she, this is how she describes it. She went, we walked, they are now he and they have recorded. And that's how they tell their story. So thank you for the support that you gave to us years ago and to friends and actually family members of mine. I'm tearing up. <laughs> uh, That's understandable, Councillor. Um, I was just on the subcommittee back then. I was vice chair of the Barry subcommittee. But a friend of mine who attended that event had a very similar story. Uh, after attending, she realized she was trans and she's going through that process. And actually her and her wife are quite happy now and were recently in the paper. I can't remember what the article was called, but I think it was uh, how, I can't remember what it said, but it was something about my wife and I and our family or something like that. It was a very touching article. I'm glad we were able to help you. Uh, to answer your question though, I am, I'm not Indigenous. I am a settler and I am not two-spirit. I'm cisgender. So I don't have personal experience I can bring to that, but I'm still more than willing to participate in that. Thank you. Um, I, I have a, a question about uh, the, the crosswalk and it's, it's sort of more academic than anything, I think. Um, what, what is the purpose in your mind for the crosswalk? The purpose of a crosswalk is to show community that the municipality is accepting in that it does provide visual representation of the queer community and the 2S LGBTQ community. So it's basically to convey a, um, a, a message, we are here, we're part of your community uh, and um, just to create a positive vibe. That That's correct, Mr. Mayor. It essentially sends the same message as the flag racing we just did. Uh, right. I, yeah, in fact, I was just, uh, we were having a, a meeting and Mr. Deneau happened to be outside and the image it was, there was the flag in the background. Um, the reason I asked the question is because uh, there are potential uh, alternatives, not that uh, actually amplify the message in a way, because if you look at um, models that look at uh, how things distribute over time, uh, whether it's uh, predator prey models or whether it's uh, epidemiology models where disease promulgates across the world. And uh, so if you have a static point, then the number of contacts to that point are, can be, if it's a very high traffic volume place, we'll say like grounded or the community center, uh, you're going to get a fair bit of traffic. But if you actually then start to move that through the community. And the, the, the point I'm getting to is if, for example, you put the pride colors on all our buses. So the colors are then, you're achieving the goal and having it move through the entire community, whether it's in at Midland and Penetang, as a matter of fact, and between. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, that absolutely is an option. Like it doesn't necessarily have to be a pride cross. So it's just, that's what was originally suggested so FSP ultimately decided to try sticking with that, but there are always other things that can be done instead of or conjunctured with. I believe in the past, like the McLaren Art Center in Barrie, I believe they partnered with a local cement company, which essentially put local works of art on the drums of cement machines. So as they were going around town, you could just see this art rolling around. Right. So it gets to a broader audience, more appreciation and so on, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like uh, this is Likely to be a bit of an open dialogue. That'd be fair. Yeah, okay. Sounded like it might be. Sounds like it'd be an interesting one too. Really enjoyed the uh, your presentation. Are there any other questions from council for Mr. Nelthorpe? 
Well, I really appreciate you bringing this forward. It was a pleasure meeting you at the flag raising. And uh, it's a, uh, I know it's got to be a job of work being the, uh, the head of the executive now of Simco Fuerte. So thanks for stepping up and taking that on. And I uh, look forward to meeting you more and uh, to seeing what we can explore in terms of some of the things you've suggested tonight. Hopefully, I'm going to, to Councillor Gordon's point, I'm going to suggest an, uh, uh, a uh, modification to his motion, which would take us down that road, I think, engagement, if that's uh, so. Uh, if uh, there are no further questions, I'll say thank you very much and uh, look forward to the motion from Councillor Gordon and what we can do in terms of modifying it to achieve what you've suggested this evening, which is dialogue and consultation. And have a wonderful thank you evening. for having you here, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, your meeting today. Thank you. Good night. Uh, uh, Oh, yes. So we're now at uh, item nine, which is public meeting and hearings. There are none. Reports well, and other items withdrawn from the consent agenda for which for council's consideration rather, and there are none. Which now brings us to the COVID-19 update uh, and the CAO will provide us with a verbal update. Mr. Deneau. Mr. Mayor and, and members of council, and with your permission, Mr. Mayor, I'm wondering if I can take just a moment to introduce Adam Farr. I think it's Adam's first uh, council meeting with us, and certainly uh, he's been in, in the planning, bylaw, and building seat for, for a few weeks with us. He unfortunately had a little bit of a setback with, with the Viking incident. However, he's uh, back at the helm, and I just wanted to give him a moment to say hello to uh, certainly the public and council. So over to you, Adam. Uh, thank you, uh, C.A. Denon. It's, it's a real pleasure to have joined the town. I, I've actually been here uh, officially for a couple, almost a couple of months now. Um, it's uh, been great uh, working with the team uh, of overseeing and we're starting to see the kind of recovery of the planning division with uh, our manager of planning, Steve Farquharson, coming on board. And we've been connecting with a lot of people in the development industry and members of the public who are uh, interested in uh, speaking with people on development matters. I've, I've had uh, the opportunity to speak with the mayor and we had a, a great conversation uh, and it's a real pleasure to be in front of council this evening. And uh, I look forward to uh, meeting Wall and, and appearing before you uh, in the coming months and years. So just really glad to be here and, and pleased frankly to be nearing 100% capacity on the job now. So thanks again. Welcome. Great, thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing that opportunity. Adam's been uh, obviously a great addition to the team, so uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy working from, working with him and hearing from him. On the COVID front, I'll go through um, a few stats because I think it's important just to ground all of us on where we are uh, across the province, where we are in Simcoe, Muskoka, and where we are in Midland. And I think we all know that the government, uh, under consultation from the chief medical officer, uh, is putting a pause on the exit of the roadmap to reopen. So as you know, we're in the step three. Um, there was some uh, thought that we might be moving out of step three into whatever the next stage is. However, they paused that for now because of the variant that, uh, that we're all hearing about. Uh, I think everyone is indicating this might be a fourth wave, but that wave has got characteristics that are different from some of the other waves that we've seen. Maybe not as severe for the people who are vaccinated, but still severe for those who are not. So I think that's, the, that's um, how it's being looked at today. So we, we remain um, cautious. We remain uh, uh, ready to work with uh, the government, certainly on what they uh, announce in terms of any next stages and the health units working with them on any potential policy changes or regulations that would have to be changed in conjunction with that. It was actually done very quickly for step three. We were actually to get the regulation changes almost on the same day that the, that the announcement was made. So I think we're all getting into a rhythm of, having, of adapting to this and moving uh, very quickly in terms of adapting. So whatever comes forward, I, I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to adjust services and, and give guidance to our residents and businesses uh, quite swiftly. So that's uh, overall at the province level. In terms of Ontario's vaccination, there's been a little over 20 million uh, doses administered across the province. 
about about 72 percent of all people in Ontario receive at least one dose. So that's the entire population, about 72 percent. About 65 percent of all people in, in Ontario are fully vaccinated. So when you look at the entire population, about 65 percent of them are fully vaccinated. But that leaves a little over 5 million people in this province who are not vaccinated, who are not fully vaccinated. Uh, and that's about the population of Ireland, population of Norway, if you like, population of New Zealand, uh, in terms of you know, the number of people that still remain unvaccinated in this province. So still a significant number. The number that the health unit wants to get to is about 90% vaccinated. And that's to try and get to that herd immunity. Um, you know, within the uh, the provincial area, at least. We know this is a global issue, but certainly we're, we're all setting that target and trying to achieve it. So that's uh, where we are on the vaccination status. In Simcoe, Muskoka, uh, almost 500,000 people have been immunized with the first dose. Uh, about 375,000, which is about 71% of our total population, uh, sorry, 12 and up, have received uh, two doses. Okay, so about 71%, 12 and up have received two doses. So, you know, that's, that's pretty encouraging for, you know, uh, again, um, our region. But again, we want to, to obviously get to as many people as possible. So vaccination continues to be a, a really important aspect of, of trying to get a grip on things. In terms of Midland, we're, we, we're, we saw a little bit uh, of a bump. In the, in the month of August, which is only kind of halfway through. So four cases through this month, all those cases are for people, you know, under 34, two of them under 17 and two of them, you know, under that 34 uh, age bracket. So again, hitting that demographic and, and obviously probably for the, the reason because they're unvaccinated for, for whatever reason. So still continues, you know, to hit uh, certain people. And again, if you're unvaccinated, you can get severely ill. If you are vaccinated, you can still catch COVID. Uh, unlikely, you know, you'll be severely ill. Uh, you could, could get some kind of illness, but certainly something that we think is, is able to be taken care of uh, fairly readily. So that's uh, where we are in terms of, um, you know, the epidemiology and what's going on with the vaccination situation. In terms of what's going on with town services, all town services remain available. We're, we're operating under protocols that we've been operating under for some time. So distancing people, wearing PPE, it's very common for us in the workplace to be using masks and, and distancing and having meetings outside when we need to, using virtual models. And we're also protecting staff who, who need to be protected, uh, you know, because of their, either their situation at home or because of their own personal health situation. So we're taking advantage of virtual means to, to help do that. Uh, I've always said we've got fragile uh, staffing in some situations because we only have one person who's able to do some of these responsibilities. And if that one person uh, is taken out, that's a serious impact of the services we can offer. So we're trying to avoid that. And we think we've, we've really done a great job at being able to carry on and be highly efficient in delivering the services in the manner that we're able to. So there's more people coming into the office. We're being very careful about that. We're monitoring that really carefully. We're watching all the policy work that's, that you're hearing about, about uh, disclosing whether you're vaccinated or not, or, or requiring mandatory vaccination. I think certainly from my perspective, uh, we'll let that settle. I have no concerns at all about being able to serve our residents and our businesses and being able to keep them safe and our staff safe. So, so for, from our perspective, things are, are working quite well. Um, on the vaccination center front, uh, the, the health unit, and there was an announcement that came out later today, which you know I can provide a little more guidance on. Uh, they've announced that the mass vaccin vaccination centers, uh, certainly ours will be closing towards the end of August. And that's intentional. They're going to a more targeted strategy to deliver the vaccine to those individuals that um, maybe have, can't access a larger center and to go to the places where those individuals who need the vaccine can get it more, more easily. So you're gonna see a lot more pop-up clinics. You might see the use of healthcare practitioners uh, extended even more. 
and uh, seeing them going into other areas to make it more readily available. So that's certainly the intent. So our, our vaccination center should close by the end of August. Uh, the one vaccination center that they have in Barrie will remain open until the end of September. Um, so they're contacting everyone who has appointments in those vaccination centers and encouraging them to move those appointments up to ensure that you know they can get their first or second dose in, in a timely manner through those, those areas. The other thing that uh, they, they announced uh, as well today, and they call this the last mile strategy for closing or for you know closing the gap on vaccination is they've also announced third doses for specific groups. So this is that booster dose that you keep hearing about. And so lots of work being done on when and where uh, that may be necessary. Uh, but today the, the chief medical officer did announce there are some very specific groups that can receive that third dose. Um, just to give you an idea, those groups are their transplant recipients, uh, hematological cancers, you know, specific type of cancers that, that people may have uh, will be eligible for that third dose. And then there's also residents in high risk congregate settings. So some of those are long term care settings, but they're high risk ones. And I think in all those cases, those people will be contacted by either the health unit or their or their health care practitioner who takes care of their care to make sure that they're going to be getting those third shots. Uh, the final thing that they announced as well, and again, you may have heard that, is again, extending the vaccination eligibility. We're still, we're still capped at that 12-year age. Well, they've expanded it slightly, and they said youth who are 11 turning 12 in 2021 can now receive uh, the vaccine, and it's the um, Pfizer vaccine that they've announced is, is safe for those individuals. So again, if you're 11... In two, if you're 11 today, turning 12 in 2021, they've opened the vaccination up to that uh, age group. So lots of work, obviously, ongoing. Again, I think everyone's being quite cautious. I think the wave that we're talking about, as I mentioned, is a different wave. Um, but again, I think we're trying to encourage as many people to uh, get vaccinated as early as possible so we don't have to deal with another variant that, you know, that could establish itself and and continue to uh, have us deal with the situation even longer. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor, and certainly welcome any questions. Thank you, Mr. Deneau. Any questions for Mr. Deneau? I see Councillor Gordon, and I see Councillor Mayne. Thank you, Mr. Deneau. Uh, as we saw online, the Y is now open. Again, that's wonderful. Um, with the mass vaccination center's closure, does that mean that uh, we're putting in ice? Just through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, we um, we had a plan. We always had a plan. You know, we had we had anticipated um, the option of of being able to offer services in limited capacity, but still, you know, being required to offer a vaccination center. So we had always thought of a plan of maybe shifting that vaccination center to another area to allow us to offer, uh, you know, a second pad. Uh, so that was always, uh, you know, something we had considered. The timing of this just allows us to obviously be able to offer those services. And yes, the intention is to put ice into that second time. Uh, thank you. Uh, just the comment, if we're uh, winding down the mass vaccination clinics, uh, perhaps uh, our communications team can continue to boost the messages from the health unit and all the local pharmacies that still have walk-in clinics and all the various ways that we're distributing the vaccine in the community. Uh, Midlands numbers were doing pretty good, but like you said, there's we still need to close that gap. So uh, just trying to get the word out how easy it is. Uh, I was just at the pharmacy the other day. People are coming in uh, just right then and there. Uh, no sign up required. Just you know, fill up the sheet and away you go. Um, so I guess that's a we just keep gotta uh, keep pushing that message. Just the vaccines are available and they're super easy to get and they're safe and effective. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. We'll uh, I'll make sure Randy and our comms team continues to, you know, forward the information we get from the health unit. Any further questions or comments for Mr. Deneau? Uh, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Deneau. Um, we'll move on to item 11, which is notices of motion. Are there any from council? Councillor Prost. Sorry about that. Um, I haven't put it in, but I can. I have a draft notice of motion. 
is this the time I can do that? Sure. I can just read it in now and. Well, if you just want to state what it is, we can we can craft it in terms. If you've got it in broad terms, but it needs to be. Uh, okay, that's fine. Um, then you, we can do. Okay, that. it's. Okay, thank you. It's regarding the um, the deputation and petition we 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 received from Midland Point Road residents. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see it anywhere, and I, I I'm asking that it be added for public consultation and discussion um, by council to consider something to make them feel safer on Midland Point Road. So if I, um, I, I take it you're aware that there's a public consultation next week on the 24th at 7, and they are actually participating in that and putting forward their um, their concerns again. Uh, I also know that there's been, uh, I received probably the same letter that you did. And I'm in the okay. process of crafting a response, which basically speaks to one the question of policing uh, i travel that road every day i've seen <laughs> i think i was surprised by one coming over that hill that cody will know about after the turn uh and thought oh well, there goes the mayor <laughs> done for a traffic ticket but uh fortunately not so they are there i, I need to point that out to miss to the uh, petitioner uh also the question of um the uh, radar wagon it's i was there for two weeks it was just at the other end and uh, it was actually what they call stealth mode. Uh, and I went by and I'm like, why is that thing not running? Why is it not what it was? And uh, in running it in stealth mode, they got uh, some fairly interesting data, but the data showed that it was plus or minus 1% of the posted limit on average, which if you took it into the traffic calming model proposed, it wouldn't even register. It wouldn't even be considered as an issue. Now they're moving it down to the other end. Um, to the area where the petitioners and, and a group, the group of people who signed are uh, actually uh, you know, have their residences and we'll see what the result is there. The other thing that's come to, my, come to our attention is that there are five to 600 people living further down the road. And this has been designated collector in successive transportation master plans. It's not just the traffic calming policy. And uh, so, Fundamentally, we'd have to consult also with those other 500 people to see whether or not they wanted to see that limit reduced. The other, uh, the other issue there, of course, is um, is um, the lack of a sidewalk, and yeah. uh, that is something that municipality inherited when Middle Point was annexed from Tay into Midland, and same with Sunnyside. So Sunnyside's in the same boat as Councillor Cunningham will attest. There are no sidewalks there, and it, yeah. it's um, I think in some parts of Sunnyside, it's a little easier to walk because they're not through three streets. Everton might be the exception. Um, so the question then is, how do you deal with that? We are going to be doing some road works there uh, with potential that there's potential to broaden the shoulders a little bit so that like uh, when you get out to Curry Road, between Curry Road and Mondays, Mondays Bay Road, you pave the shoulders. It has some benefit to uh, to the actual of maintaining the asphalt for a longer period of time, but it also gives you a place to walk and clear snow off of. Uh, but to go in some parts there, it's not likely feasible without doing significant works. And, and then, so the option then is to put in place a community improvement project or plan for that site, and then charge back the costs to the residents for the work in that particular locality. I'm in the process of, um, with AMO and doing deputations and so on. I didn't get a chance to answer, so I'm in the process of providing that feedback back to her. So, uh, so, so having said all that, if you still wish to put that motion forward, by all means do so, and uh, we'll bring it before council. Okay. Know, um, coming, it will come to council in the co traffic calming report. Okay, I just want to make sure it didn't get missed. That's all. So I, I don't need to do that right now? No, I would not want to incur the wrath of the petitioner. She's quite serious. So I want to make sure she's listened to and heard and that she okay, well and safety is quite serious too. So it's it's something we do need to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm That's sorry, it just it feels really weird talking because everybody's frozen. I'm the only one moving. So anyway. Um so I'll hold off for now. Okay. It's up to you. Thank you. If you wish to bring it forward, by all means do so. But I I, I think you'll find that that uh, process is, there's a process. And we'll see whether I, I don't know whether they'll be satisfied with the result, but I think it'll be they're getting a 
you know, everybody's paying attention to what they're the, what they're bringing forward along with everybody else. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Are there any other notices from counselors? Okay. Seeing none. Um, general announcements. Are there any general announcements that people like to make? I see Councilor Main and I see Councilor Gordon. Okay. Councilor Main. Uh, thank you. It's been an event, eventful summer, so I just have a few, a few quick ones I want to give shout outs to. Um, if you haven't noticed, the Heronia Museum has posted the executive director position. And so I wanted to take the opportunity to give Nahani Bourne a huge shout out. She's decided that she's going to pass the baton to the next person in the relay. And we just can't thank Nahani enough for her amazing time. As we joked, she left quite the Bourne legacy at the Heroni Museum and uh, she will be missed. And we just can't thank her enough for all the awesome uh, fun ideas and all her passion towards history. Uh, so thank you so much, Nahani. Um, secondly, uh, Monday we got, uh, had an amazing uh, funding announcement, New Horizons Transit uh, Program, but we want to give a huge shout out to Mr. Bruce Stanton. Uh, it might've been his last public uh, appearance. So it was great that it was in Midland, um, but, I, I know a lot of my uh, colleagues, one of the highlights of going to the AMO conference was Bruce Stanton would take us into parliament and show us around parliament building. And that was a real highlight, not just of the AMO conference, but of the whole term of council. And that's a really lasting memory that we'll all always have. And so we can't thank Bruce enough for that. That's a really classy uh, thing because Bruce is a classy guy. Um, three, Pete Wright is an amazing planter of trees. And uh, I've been getting a lot of feedback from people that are just, uh, so helpful, uh, so thankful for Pete for being great uh, customer service and finding great locations for trees for a memorial tree program. If you haven't seen, uh, our dear friend George McDonald has a tree and a bench. And so Catherine mentioned to me, she just wanted to say how amazing Pete was to work with. And that's not the first time, but the second time this summer, somebody's went out of their way to say what a great job that they're doing. So kudos to uh, Pete Wright. Um, Finally, uh, also, uh, we want to give a huge shout out to the artists, uh, Holly and Holly Archer and Camille Miles. Uh, the Sewn was installed last week. So thanks to Jonathan uh, Killing and Mike Billick who designed and manufactured the idea that Holly and Camille came up with. Thanks to Karen for uh, uh, securing funding and Mitch Sobel for helping to review that and install it. And finally, if you get a chance tonight as the sun is going down, we're going to be showing big news from Grand Rock. Uh, the movie shot here in Midland. And if you can't make it tonight, next week we have Ryan the Last Dragon, a Disney, a Disney Pixar classic, uh, which just came out last year. So thank you. That's the letter bag for me. Thank you. Councilor Maine, uh, is there anything else left in town we're talking about? Councilor Gordon. <laughs> Thanks. That big news movie is awesome. I caught that on a plane ride somewhere. And at first I thought, oh God, this is going to be a real yawner, but it'll be fun to check out some local, uh, you know, uh, set areas. And some of our local fixtures but it was actually a really good movie so anyway if you get a chance to see that for sure um i've got a quick one it's it focuses around food security and something new coming to the community i just wanted to give a shout out uh it's called the georgian bay food network and it offers assistance with food insecurity by providing like a healthy perishable non-perishable foods it's a little different than the food bank it's not you know you don't go there and just get a basket of stuff whether you like it or not you know don't have a lot of say and i'm not you know slamming the food bank at all or any food bank, but they hope their community, the community here will take advantage of this storefront style food bank uh, with the store accessibility to select their own food items. And the goal here is to really end the stigma that can be associated with asking for assistance uh, by providing a safe and comfortable environment for community members in need. And this is right off their website. And so they are gonna be opening up, uh, uh, I think Alexandria Hamlin's leading it with a, probably a team of talented people. They're gonna be opening up next month and they're located at 230 Albertine Boulevard, units one and two. So that's the pink buildings there just down from the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and they'll be providing assistance and service to Midland, Penetang Machine, Tiny and Tay and, and Christian Island. So you can check out their uh, website if you want to learn a bit more about them at georgianbayfoodnetwork.com. And uh, there'll be lots of opportunities. Uh, I'm sure they'll be always looking for help and for some guidance and, you know, to serve the people that really need this resource in our community. So uh, big shout out to them. That's awesome. I look forward to uh, the grand opening. Councillor, anybody else with uh, an announcement? Councillor Cunningham. 
Um, not a further announcement so much as just expanding on Councillor Main's mention of the um, seniors on the move pilot project with our Midland Transit. I just wanted to mention that if you go to midland.ca slash transit, you can figure out where to get either free transit passes or free smart cards with free rides preloaded and how to refill those, as well as to look up the free ride days for seniors where you don't need a pass or a smart card. So that's midland.ca slash transit. So you can find out where you can pick up your free passes or where you can pick up the smart cards and get them loaded and days throughout this year and into the next when you can just participate in a free ride, ride day. And I want to really appreciate our seniors council for persisting in pursuing this free transit to get our seniors on the move. So thank you for that entire group of seniors council as well. And Karen Mealing for really working hard on finding and preparing for grants sometimes in advance and sometimes just drop right in her lap at the last minute. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Uh, I have a couple for me. Uh, and first is to reinforce the great work that the Seniors Council has been doing. Very dynamic. They're integrating their efforts throughout Simcoe North, consulting with other seniors committees, also vertically to uh, the county and to the province. and basically uh, taking advantage of programming by preparing for things like the New Horizons and the Seniors in Motion, if I got that right. But in, they put the grant in, they persisted, and uh, kudos to them uh, for doing so. Great group of people moving the yard stick tremendously down the field, uh, and thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I believe, and maybe Councillor Cunningham or Councillor Maine can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Tugfest is this weekend. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Unfortunately, we can't actually tour the boats, but uh, it'd be good, great to go down and see them and, and at least getting back to that new normal. Um, I'd also like to just um, mention that David Jeffries, who uh, has been the executive director of Chigamick for some time, who was one of the key people in getting the health team established here uh, in this area, as well as the health team in Aurelia, as well as the health team out of Barrie. Very dynamic, energetic individual who can bring people together who may not necessarily agree on things and get them to actually work together to achieve it, to achieve it result. He's actually leaving Chigamick. So I'd just like to be on behalf of the residents of Midland and this council to thank him for all his efforts, both here at Chigamick and beyond, uh, and wish him well in his endeavors. Uh, I, I think he's just, uh, I don't think he's going anywhere. He's, he's just gonna delve, put his feet into other waters. I'm hoping that he might consent to being part of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Committee, uh, maybe even chairing it. And I'm hoping that I know, I understand he might be going into working in the, um, the environmental sector. So from one easy portfolio to another. So. He's, uh, I wish him well on our behalf. I, I offer our heartfelt thanks from the community and, and this council to Mr. Jeffries and uh, wish him all the best. Um, I'd also, uh, speaking of staff and accomplishments, um, we've had a series of letters uh, about our Harbor staff and I just want to comment on our Harbor staff. People come here to spend a day and end up spending a week. And the answer why always is, it's a fabulous facility. The service is marvelous. The staff are very congenial and helpful. And I just couldn't help but think that we should probably spend the rest of the week here. I mean, we've had I don't know, a number of these. So many thanks to the staff down at the harbor. It actually does look amazing. And uh, I, I'm, uh, thank you very much for uh, representing Midland in such a uh, professional and courteous way. So. Uh, yeah, thanks to uh, Rick Belziel and, and his staff. Um, I was going to talk about doing deputations to the uh, tourism minister or parliamentary assistant and the minister of infrastructure, but I could get very long-winded on that. Suffice it to say, we made presentations to both um, and emphasized the fact that um, a lot of communities get what's called uh, OMPF funding, and it's sort of like an equalization payment about 400 communities in the province. 
funding model is pretty archaic. And when you look at places like Tiny, they receive $1.9 million a year from this equalization payment. Midland, which basically is driving a lot of services for the area, receives $300,000. So we wanted to impress upon both of these two groups, uh, first of all, thanking the tourism ministry for their support over the years uh, for things like the rubber ducky down the harbor, tall ships, uh, and, and, and uh, butter tart festival and so on. And encourage them to consider to support such things. In particular, uh, we've asked them to support the uh, re revitalization of the murals throughout the town. Um, and uh, they seem to have, they were a little perplexed as to what silo that might fit into, but they were very eager to figure out or maybe even create a new one. So that was, that was a good. And we impressed upon the uh, infrastructure minister, again, the OMPF thing. It's really a um, finance ministry uh, matter, but it involves all of cabinet in the conversation. So it's our hope that they'll treat Midland a little more equitably over the long haul. This is something that is near and dear to Mr. Deneau, and he's the, he's the one championing that, unearthing it in a sense, and then championing it. And uh, if we just keep repeating that message, then I think we'll be in good stead. So that was some of the things that happened this week, and the province is certainly noticing noticing Midland, the butter tart, and all the things that are going on. And uh, we're hoping they'll come up for the uh, King Street opening, which I think is around uh, the 25th of September. I'll let the cat out of the bag there, but um, so it should be a, a fun a fun day in, in Midland. That's all I have. Thank you for listening, Councilor Gordon. Sorry about that. I forgot one thing, and it was really more just to get uh, our CAO to comment. Um, you know, as people know, I tend to live a little bit online and participate with the online community. And there's been, uh, as as you can imagine, with the new art installation of Sewn, there's, you know, people that love it or people that hate it. It always seems to be two sides of the spectrum. And regardless where people's uh, hearts are with when it comes to, you know, installation art, the, the common critique uh, that I've been trying to, you know, get the word out about is, you know, Midland raised taxes to pay for this. And, you know, I've been doing what I can to dispel that myth, but uh, perhaps it would be good just to reiterate at this juncture uh, where the funding arrived from for this installation uh, and, you know, how it came about. I know it's been, it's on, on the Engaging Midland website for those who'd like to, you know, get the, from the horse's mouth, but perhaps the uh, substitute horse could provide us with uh, uh, a, an update, which we've already had at council in the past, but just one more time, just to let people know where the, money came from for that installation. And that would be just lovely. It would help me out anyway. Mr. Deneau. Thank you. Uh, thank you again through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to, to Councillor Gordon. And you can correct me if, if uh, I get this incorrect, but the funding came through OMAF or the ministry, uh, uh, whatever OMAF stands for. So <laughs> the, the, the ministry is part of the downtown King Street revitalization project. So it did not come from our, our resident taxpayers. And absolutely, I, I appreciate your comments about art is in the, certainly of the eye of the beholder. Um, um, I think it's a tremendous, um, tremendous addition to, to Midland. This is a very innovative artistic community. And um, I think it's wonderful that we're able to add something of this nature made by local artists, um, selected by local people um, to be displayed here. And I fully expected people to have different opinions on, on art, as is always the case. But uh, uh, thank you for allowing us to clarify that this was funded through the ministry. There will be a plaque going on it that will give you more information about the inspiration. You can go online and find what the inspiration behind Sewn is. Um, there is a lot of inspiration from this artist about, about the, uh, the character of this piece. Uh, but the plaque will also indicate how it was funded. So supply and, and uh, getting supply of certain things is a little bit difficult these days. So the timing didn't, didn't wind up, but uh, we wanted to get the art piece installed and we're going to get the plaque put on it fairly soon. Thank you very much. I appreciate that update. Um, I basically have said verbatim, not the amount for parks. I don't know about that, but um, the second thing was about Tugfest and parking at the town dock area. Uh, just for clarity's sake, the town dock is the one parking lot that we don't offer the one hour free parking at, um, if I recall correctly. 
uh, as we do on other back lots, but it is still free on, you know, after 5 p.m. and it's free on weekends, if, if, if I understand correctly. And I just wanted to clarify that any visitors to the community or residents that want to go down and see Tugfest and parking there on the weekend, it remains free. Mr. Uh, yeah, through you, uh, through you, um, your mayor, I'll, I'll ask um, Andy if, if perhaps he can clarify. I'm not sure if it is free. Um, if Andy can add any, any additional detail to that, I'd ask him to. Uh, uh, through your worship to Councillor Gordon, no, it is not free out the weekend, so it is paid parking uh, uh, from eight to five on the weekends. Okay, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. paid parking, so there, there is no real free daylight hours for parking at that town dock. That's the only lot that we have like that, right? That is correct. Okay. Thanks for that clarity. I wasn't sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Campbell. I seem to have um, encountered a problem here. Oh, there we go. Minimize the screen. I couldn't find screen. Uh, screen. I couldn't find anybody. Uh, any other? Let me see. Uh, I think I saw Councillor McGinn, but I don't see her on the screen now. I think she's suffering from the freeze. There, she looks frozen to me. Is it non-existent? I'm just uh, there, no, no, nope. gone. Well, I'll give her an opportunity after. Uh, I think we'll just sort of keep moving uh, at this point. So I'm going to um, suggest we move out of committee of the whole at this point. Um, so I have a motion um, that the committee of the whole rise and report. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. That carries. And. Uh, Then we have a motion moved by Councillor Downer, second by Councillor Shevsky, that the recommendations of the Committee of the Whole for the meeting August 18th, 2021, be adopted as resolutions of Council. Any comments or questions from Council on that motion? Don't see any, uh, so all in favor. Thank you, that also uh, carries. Next, we are at um, motions for which notice was given. And we have two this evening, uh, both by Councillor Gordon. Uh, the first is, um, uh, well, I'll let Councillor Gordon introduce it. Hey, I like that fire truck. All right, there we go. Yeah, Paul Ryan's probably just like, what is he gonna do to me? <laughs> um, yeah, I liked your idea about the bus too. This was forwarded to me by uh, a local resident, um, tongue in cheek, but also serious. So. Long story short, I think I tried to uh, give the background on, um, you know, why I reached out to Simcoe Pride and invited them to do the deputation tonight. And it certainly wasn't to, uh, you know, walk back on the commitment because, I mean, I think I brought that motion for it, for it anyway a couple of years ago and it was unanimous, unanimously supported. My concern lies around, you know, the cost uh, to build this thing to start with, keeping our taxes in check, the cost of maintaining it if it's going to be 16 grand to repaint it every time with the fancy paint. Um, this, the OPEX on this could just spiral out of control and I want to try and be responsible with our tax dollars. But at the same token, I don't want to, you know, turn my back on an entire community support that not only we pledged, but also that it's well deserving of it. So I was looking for alternatives and, uh, and they, they awesomely provided some great alternatives, murals, public art installations, something more than just a flag for a month here and there. Uh, the idea of a festival is great too, but I wouldn't want to see that instead of. So Originally, when I put the motion in, it was a bit more wordy. I know it's it's shocking to hear that uh, than it is as it appears right now. And senior team got together and kind of uh, took a machete to it and really cut it to the chase, which is, um, you know, I was fine with. So effectively, what my, my motion was asking for here is that we cancel the implementation of the Rainbow Crosswalk due to the concerns about vandalism and the maintenance costs specifically. Uh, not the active maintenance, but the cost of it, and consider an alternative that we would hear about tonight in the deputation. So the considered alternative is missing from this motion, uh, but it was there when I originally submitted it. So I am, uh, you know, based on what I heard tonight, 
I am fully willing to either abandon this motion uh, with no seconder, or if we can get a seconder, uh, let's talk about it and amend it so that we can find a fit. There are lots of alternatives out there. The bus driving around is a great one. You know, uh, uh, what do they call it? Wrapping the bus. Um, there's also wrapping the fire truck, which, you know, gets a lot of kilometers. You know, you see it around town a lot since we respond to medical assists. There, there's a lot of things we can do in the community that, you know, wouldn't be as easy to vandalize uh, as the crosswalk. But I don't want that alone to be the reason why we would consider not installing it. So that's the preamble. Uh, that's where we're at. I'm good with this either way. I'm content to see a, a installation of a crosswalk and other things or other things. Can I make a suggestion then, uh, Councillor, uh, that we amend the motion before it's put on the floor? Uh, and I, um, I, so I had I had the clerk put something together that um, because I got a sense from your correspondence and what I was saying coming down from the that there was probably room for conversation around this. So basically, it's your motion uh, that council cancel the implementation of a rainbow crosswalk due to concerns with respect to vandalism and maintenance, and that Fierta Simcoe Pride work with staff to consider alternatives and the budget required to be presented by Fierta Simcoe Pride to Council at a later date for consideration. So it basically opens up staff, Fierta Pride Simcoe, having a conversation about the, the alternatives and the options that were presented by Mr. Melbourne. Does that work for you? It absolutely does. I mean, the collaboration and, you know, revisiting this now that a couple of years have passed, there's just no good reason to close our ears and stick with what we originally debated emotionally. Let's take a, a fresh look at this. A couple of years have gone by. If it ends up that, you know, we do this and go through the machinations of it and the best uh, option is still a crosswalk, then let it be. Okay, so uh, do you want to move that and will somebody second it for Councillor Gordon? Councillor Post will second. Um, so, effectively, the addition to the publish, what was published, is that Fierte Simcoe Pride work with staff to consider alternatives and the budget required to be presented by Fierte Simcoe Pride to Council at a later date for consideration. Any comments or questions from Council on the motion as, as presented now? Councillor Main. And I have Councillor Olszewski. Thank you. I'm not going to support this motion. I think the crosswalk is just, it's just a simple crosswalk initiative. Let's get it done, and then we'll move to Plan B and then Plan C before we write it off. And also, I just wanted to comment that I'm not really comfortable with the insinuation that Midland is a community that has people that are hateful or homophobic. I just, I don't think that's a good statement for public. Uh, officials to be making about the community. Um, I, I just think that we're trying to be inclusive and we can't worry about, you know, the rare chance that something bad might happen. I mean, we don't, that doesn't apply to public art installations. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I, I fully support the crosswalk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Olszewski, I believe. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, certainly, um, I was going to say pretty much the same thing that Councillor Main said. Uh, I didn't really feel comfortable supporting this motion. I feel like um, when Fear Day Simco Pride came into this meeting, they had a crosswalk, and at the end of this, they'll have a promise from some politicians for some more conversation, and that in two bucks will get you a cup of coffee at Grounded. So um, I personally think that uh, they were further ahead at the start of this meeting than uh, this motion has kind of created a monster. So I think we've committed to the crosswalk. They seem like they... Um, a cross crosswalk seems to be a, an ongoing theme across different municipalities and uh you know we can't turn our back on hate we can't uh you know be inspired by hate like Councilor Main was trying to say and uh the presenter was also clear in saying that uh they didn't want that to be a reason why we didn't do a crosswalk so I won't be supporting the motion but I do commit to um doing the crosswalk um the fire trucks the bus um very proud and a, a definite ally thank you thank you any other comments or questions on the motion as presented? So uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Sorry, Your Worship. I think uh, Councillor McGinn had her card up, but just a I'll little glitchy. Councillor McGinn, uh, please. I didn't see your hand. Okay, I understand. Um, there's there, there's internet 
connection issues on this side of the town. I'm not sure what's going on. So um, I'm not sure if this is proper policy or procedure in the way to move forward. I understand because of history, sometimes we have to defeat something to retable and it has, it, it's, anyway, I'm gonna, I, so this is what I wanna say. Hey, you know what? A crosswalk walk, absolutely fantastic. Yes, I support that. I am really proud of my fellow counselor for amending. Um, I understand that it happened today. It happened really quickly. So if I could maybe put it in, speak this way and hopefully counselor Gordon will hear what I'm saying. They do this in a timely manner. So if we could have a timeline on this instead of at a later date, um, that we have a quick conversation so that as worded before by somebody else that, you know, it's not just a bunch of politicians saying, let's talk and do absolutely nothing. Um, that we expedite the process because this is, this is something that we had said before we did support. Um, and, and I understand the concern and the message sent that we're delaying. Um, that's not it. I don't believe that is the spirit of it. It's not about delay. It's about trying to engage in better conversation and broader scope. Um, so perhaps, uh, Councillor Gordon, you'd be interested in adding a very specific timeline to having a discussion about, you know, possible other means of showcasing our support. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be content with putting a timeline on this. I, I too, as Councillor Wachowski's concern is I don't want this to just be deferred into oblivion. Um, I, I think a big part of this, what might even help us tonight is to find out for Mr. Campbell, if we've procured the paints, if we have a process identified, if we've identified locations, are we, you know, paintbrush ready? Or uh, you know, are we looking at two to three months anyway, which puts us into the you know no paint zone because it's winter, um, and we'd be doing this in the spring. If you know, I'm just making this up right now. But if all of that was the case, and we wouldn't be doing this until early next spring, then I don't see this motion as being deferral. It's just time to like let's you know we got time anyway. Let's talk about other things uh, and not say no to it, but maybe broaden the scope. Uh, if we are paintbrush ready, then you know I. I to everyone's with a few councillors points here, maybe uh, let's just do it. So let's hear from uh, Mr. Campbell, if we could, Mr. about Campbell, where and please. how ready he is. Mr. Campbell. Uh, through your worship to uh, Councillor Gordon and the rest of council. Uh, the, the location that was uh, decided upon in working with, with the uh, committee and staff was at the west side of the intersection of uh, Bay and First uh, in front of Ground and Coffee. So that's where we have, are at this point prepared to paint that. Uh, right now, the budget that council approved was $5,000 using thermoplastic paint, which will last longer. So instead of painting every year, it might be painted every three to five years, depending on, on the traffic on it. That's $13,000. Uh, we do have uh, uh, our line painting budget that we use for painting crosswalks, painting our center line and fog lines on the road. As you've seen, we've been working on that work uh, through the summer. And at this point, uh, the, the budget gap of $8,000 that we have, if we are under budget on the rest of line painting, uh, I was planning to use that, that surplus budget to offset this uh, shortfall we have because it's also a crosswalk and line painting in the same vein. Uh, at this point, uh, we're planning to do the work in September. Uh, uh, unless we don't have budget and then we would have been coming back to council uh, likely on the September 15th uh, meeting. I would think the rest of our line paint would be done and we know if we have a budget shortfall. So our right now our plan is uh, if this isn't canceled tonight, uh, as long as we have money, we'd be doing it in the next few weeks. Uh, just a comment on the balance of other ideas and the timing of that. If it involves money, We'll be going into the budget process in a, in a few uh, weeks. Uh, staff were already in the budget process, but council will be going through it uh, later in the fall. And if it's a budgetary item, really the timing is uh, to work with the group so that 
their ideas and budget estimates can be put into it uh, in a timely manner. So it, it would be part of the 2022 budget process. It would be my recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. So it sounds like there is an objection to the first part of the motion, uh, but not necessarily an objection to the second part of the motion, which I think is a healthy thing. And as Mr. Campbell's explained, we can then, we're coming into a budget process, we can uh, ask uh, Pierre to pride to, um, to uh, prioritize and then cost out and then bring it forward as a budget recommendation, which gives you a timeline on the second part. So it would read uh, pride to council uh, through the budget 2021 budget considerations. Does that work for people? Because I think it wouldn't hurt to make that a something from council. Councillor Oshevsky, you were concerned about uh, First part for sure, and possibly this answer, and you've raised the, the specter of it going on forever. Councilor Shevsky. Thank you, Worship. If I uh, heard our director correctly, this motion is the only thing preventing this from happening in the next few weeks. So I uh, won't be supporting this amended motion. Thank you. You won't support any part of it. Okay. So that it sounds like uh, people have, made, have set their minds to this. So um, I'm going to call the question on the motion then, as, as presented. All those in favor of the motion? And those again, <laughs> usually we go and then those not in favor, but I can see that I'm alone here. So that motion fails. And uh, Mr. Campbell, I. Um, Hope I see a crosswalk in front of ground at some time in September. Kind of nice to see that in place. And I see I have some concurrence here from the rest of council. So thank you, council. It was good conversation, uh, good points raised, and um, let's watch out for that crosswalk. Maybe a few extra stop signs to stop at. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So. Councilor Gordon, your second notice of motion. Yes, uh, Councilor Shesky just nailed it. So yeah, it might be a little harder to do a burnout if you have to come to a complete stop there. So um, anyway, I, I, I gotta tell you, I am happy that we are going ahead with this. I just couldn't help but uh, be concerned, not painting our community as a racist or full of hate, but I think it's inevitable, but uh, it's not a good enough reason to not do it. So that's, that's why I voted that down. Um, Your Worship, just so you know, like you presented a really good alternative and I think we'll end up revisiting that Mr. Ryan something like that could be coming your way uh, there's lots of stuff we could do but now we're talking about still for Bay and First uh, however this follows sorry my dog's barking it's a squirrel or something up front um, and effectively this motion reads that council approve a four-way stop at the intersection of Bay and First and that bylaw 2020-65 be amended accordingly and long story short is uh, several months ago council um, approve changes to that intersection where the stop signs were kind of reversed. They were, you know, going a different direction than they were before. Uh, there arose quite a bit of community concern. It was a subject of a deputation, at least one, lots of email and letters, uh, not just from the usual Scott Campbell on behalf of the BIA, but a lot of people. So it's not just Scott, you know, he always feels, or t you know, I get the feeling he feels like he's the sort of sacrificial beating lamb and we all roll our eyes when we get an email from him kind of like when I put my mic on but uh he's uh you know he's a well-meaning guy and he went the extra mile to really research and point out some things that he feels the town um didn't really do properly in this process put up video high definition video no less of the intersection and while there can be arguments made that the same kind of offenses would be seen around town the feedback that I've got uh, you know, barring some regulatory thing that actually prohibits us from doing this uh, or some massive liability that we're going to incur by doing it, sees fit in my mind to reverse our decision and simply let's listen to the people who put us here and let's put a four-way stop in. And if it turns in, out to be, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a dumpster fire of a decision, then uh, you know what? We can reverse it and uh, use the same kind of motion and the same bylaw to change it next year. I don't personally feel we're going to have this problem 
I can see the issues where we have, uh, you know, potentially some large tractor trailers from the truck route kind of dangling out on into the intersection because they're stopped at another stop sign already. I have seen a photo of that actually happening. Uh, but those issues are few and far between compared to, I think, the greater good of causing the traffic there to come to a halt, let pedestrians move safely, enjoy the, the new crosswalk that's going to be there. And uh, let's, you know, let's not say we were wrong on this decision. I'm not asking for anyone to feel like we're undermining from the staff perspective their advice. But again, unless there's some legal reason why we can't do this, um, I'm asking the council, you know, reverse our previous decision of a couple months ago and let's install four stop signs there and just be done with this and just see how it goes. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. Campbell as the authority on the subject matter expert if he wish to speak to it. Mr. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, regulatory signs and stop control uh, is well regulated in the province of Ontario. Uh, there's two main documents that we use uh, in the engineering analysis. Uh, book five from the MPO looks at uh, the warrants that are required for stop signs and for uh, 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 signals. And then there's book 15, which is pedestrian control. And all of those, uh, the guidance and, and uh, suggestions and best practices in those books are what the courts use to uh, determine liability when an accident occurs. And the town is in, uh, many different uh, situations in front of the courts and we're challenged uh, in discoveries and, and through the proceedings as to have we followed best practice, have we followed these guidances and guidelines from the Ministry of Transportation as regulated under the Highway Traffic Act. And when you look in those uh, documents without getting into uh, a lot of it, one of the challenges, and that's why staff recommended change it, is the previous uh, stop control on First Street wasn't a best practice. And that's why there was problems there. That's why people were, were giving us guidance that there was issues because it wasn't functioning properly as an intersection. Uh, that intersection has only had four accidents in the last three years. And a four-way stop control is considered when you have four in each year. And of those four, they have to be perpendicular collisions, not offset collisions or weather related conditions. So technically from a traffic safety uh, perspective, it doesn't meet that warrant. Uh, Councillor Gordon mentioned the distance to uh, Bayshore Avenue. That's 37 meters is what the distance is from Bay to Bayshore. Under the regulations and the guidance in, in, in uh, book 15, uh, it should be 200 meters uh, for a pedestrian crosswalk, uh, a, a proper pedestrian crosswalk uh, to the nearest uh, stop control. Uh, even in, in book five, uh, it, it describes that it should be 250 meters uh, from a, a, a four-way stop to the next stop sign. So 37 meters uh, versus 250. Uh, you know, we don't have the, the warrants on the collision basis. We don't meet the warrants on the distance to a, a next stop sign. And we don't meet the warrants for the amount of traffic at that intersection. But when you do look at what might be a, uh, an approved pedestrian crossover at that, it likely meets the warrants for a level two type D uh, crosswalk. Uh, again, it's not a four-way stop, but a, a, a crosswalk with appropriate signage. Uh, and certainly, you know, if you're interested, I can show a picture of that today, or you can ask staff to come back with a report with a full analysis of, of whether, uh, what the warrants would be and what uh, the best practice uh, intersection uh, would be on that. So um, all I can say is, you know, the, the one of the very clear guidances in the uh, book five, it, it talks about inappropriate use of four-way stops. And a pedestrian uh, concern is deemed an inappropriate use for a four-way stop 
And it even goes to the point, if even if that's in a school zone, it's inappropriate to use a four-way stop for pedestrian control. That's how adamant the guidance is from the province. I'll leave it at that and answer any other questions. So just if I heard you correctly, Mr. Campbell, if we're not compliant with the various warrants and guidance with in these books um, and we end up in litigation, we're likely to be on the wrong side of the decision. Would that be fair? Our liability risk goes up. Uh, Your Worship uh, in council, uh, yes, if, if, if we are not following best practices and uh, there is an accident and, and uh, plaintiff is looking for damages, uh, you know, they are going to look for you know, 1% error on our part to be 100% liable for costs. And very clearly uh, the challenge from them, uh, which they try to succeed at and they challenge us and other municipalities. Uh, and we currently do have one uh, pedestrian uh, court case going on right now uh, that we're being challenged on, did we follow best practice? So we're, we're in the town of Midland is currently in the courts around a pedestrian accident and have we followed uh, the appropriate pro best practices. I, I can't comment further on that, but um, you know it is it is real, and we do uh, raise our risk if we don't follow the guidance. Thanks, Mr. Campbell. Um, I had Councillor McGinn had her card up, and I see Councillor Gordon. Councillor McGinn, I see Councillor Prose. Uh, okay, so my so. Through you, my question would be to uh, Mr. Andy Campbell. Um, it was, did we have notification? Did we have the notification of stop ahead? Um, did we, and I'm, I, I, I now drive, but I often walk because I choose to walk. Um, and as a, as a uh, chosen pedestrian, um, I would prefer to have a community, and I campaigned on this, and there's a couple of people that support it, that um, is very you know, pedestrian friendly. Um, that intersection is not, regardless of which way the stop sign is. Um, taking into consideration as well that, uh, um, you know, that we have, have markets that come down there um, and greater traffic. Did we, I would prefer that it was a full stop as a pedestrian and as a driver. Um, but with signs that say, stop ahead, with enough notice going out to people, with some education behind it, um, with, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, you reach out to the, to the radios and say, you know, these, this is what we are doing to be a more pedestrian friendly community. Um, so I'm not asking you, can it be done? You know, I'm asking you, how do we do what the community wants? How can we respond to the requests of the community? How can we? Where do we petition so that we can change some of the rules? Um, and how, how do we make this work moving forward? Because I don't wanna hear it can't be done because as it is, the will of council is, is we can say, okay, so there's a law there, there's a bylaw there, there's a traffic law there. We disagree because our community is, is different. Um, so what do we do so that we can respond to the people of our community who have requested this? Uh, Councilor McGinn, uh, th through, the, through the chair. Uh, council has the ultimate decision when it comes to uh, the placement of, of speed limits and regulatory signs. So council can make uh, the addition, uh, whatever decision you, you prefer. Uh, as staff though, we need to give you guidance uh, around the risk of making decisions that may cause some challenges and problems uh, if something happens. And that's, as a, a professional, I have to give you my advice and a four-way stop site is, sign is uh, not recommended or supported by myself and staff. Thank you, um, Mr. Campbell. I now have uh, Councilor Gordon. I see Councilor Shefsky as well. Thanks, just a bit of a, a follow-up. 
um, on my last question. So the, I understand the regulations will be prescriptive as to when, uh, you know, I guess they always leave it recommendation because it's up to us to hang ourselves. What they give us the rope. Um, what, is it prescriptive in that it says under these circumstances you will, or you're an idiot if you don't, put a four-way stop in or you know whatever the different regulations, or is it prescriptive saying under these circumstances you will not? Um, because I guess what I'm looking for here is just because we can do something, of course, doesn't mean we should. But um, if it doesn't say that we can't. And you know we're only concerned about liability. And when I say that, only I'm tongue in cheek. But you know, with joint and several people sue us for anything they want, anytime, anyway. If we let that scare us out of any decisions, we might as well just close up shop. But let's not do things, you know, you know, haphazardly. But if if the regulation doesn't disallow us from putting a four-way stop there, and we're stopping traffic completely to a complete halt, you know, which is a lot safer to be hit by a car that's not moving, I guess, I wouldn't even be classified as me hit than it is for somebody traveling through that intersection that's uncontrolled. Why, how I dis, what would preclude us from making this decision to stop traffic completely and err on the side of safety? And, you know, that would be the argument in court, I guess that would ultimately be tested in court, but that would be our argument that, hey, we've done everything possible to stop traffic and to limit the damage from a vehicle striking a pedestrian uh, and to make this intersection safer short of putting up traffic lights, you know, cause don't forget what we did at Young and our uh, King and uh, Elizabeth, we had the four way stops are going for a long time and we opted to better that with traffic lights at significant expense when we could have left it as a four way stop. Same thing people would argue about Dominion and King. So I guess what I'm concerned with here is that for the price of four or two more stop signs uh, to make people happy, completely stop traffic, you know, is liability being used as the uh, you know the ever present threat to stop us from making a decision because you know you recommend we don't, or are we really putting ourselves in true jeopardy by going against a regulation? If if you read the guidance in in, in book fifteen, it recommends a level two type D pedestrian crossing, which is not a four way stop. So there is guidance as to what we should be doing, given the traffic volumes and pedestrian volumes. As I said, council can choose to make a different decision. And, you know, that's council's prerogative to, to, to do that. The, you know, so, you know, you are right. Uh, but I think the way these manuals are written, the consideration is also around the vehicle movement because four-way intersections are confusing for vehicles and that's why they're not recommended to mix pedestrians in with four-way stops. Uh, how many times do each of you go to a four-way stop and you're looking around, whose turn is it next? You put pedestrians in that mix and that's why they're not recommended uh, as a traffic control mechanism. So if you're looking at it from a pedestrian perspective, there's guidance for pedestrian crossings. They give that guidance. We haven't implemented that guidance yet, but we can. Uh, as I said, I can show a picture of what that might look like or bring a report forward at a later date. Uh, they give us guidance for vehicles because we also have a responsibility to vehicles. And as I mentioned, we've had four vehicle accidents. We haven't had a pedestrian accident. And when we looked in, at some of the videos that Mr. Campbell posted online and we did our traffic counts, uh, 26 to 53% of the pedestrians did not even use the marked crosswalks that were that are there today. It, you know, that's a huge percentage of people that just ignore the, the, the pedestrian markings we already have. And again, that's why uh, transportation engineering is about psychology uh, and the human mind and how we look and see and what we feel at intersections, whether we're a pedestrian or in a car. Uh, and, you know, we all know people that don't follow the rules uh, and accidents happen and they'll, they will happen and we hope they don't. So, as I said, council, there is a recommendation uh, if we follow the guidance for a pedestrian crosswalk. There isn't guidance for a four-way stop. Council has the authority to choose whatever you wish to choose. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Um... Where am I on 
this now. Councillor Prost, I believe. Thank you. Um, I just wanna share my experience of that intersection um, for probably over a month now. I've been driving it every day, um, different times of the day, just to see what, how it feels, what's really happening. I don't necessarily see a lot of traffic when I'm there. It doesn't mean that it's not there at times, but when I'm traveling east on Bay Street and I need to pull out enough to see because there's parked trucks and cars, and I mean like pickups, so nothing huge. I can't see cars coming down um, well enough unless I pull out. And as soon as somebody comes around the corner from Bay Street, they don't have a stop sign, they're right there. And that's happened several times. I'm just saying that for me, it feels very uncomfortable because you're inching out and you're trying to see, and it just doesn't always work. In my mind, just being able to stop, make sure everything's fine and then go feels much safer as a driver. And I'm sure even more so as a pedestrian. So I just wanted to share that. I, I don't like it the way it is. And I've driven it a few times a day for a long time now. And I actually, not this week, I'm not comfortable with it. So I haven't done it this week. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I now have Councillor Shevsky. Well, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> it's uh, my intention to support this motion tonight. Um, I'm, I've worked in skilled trades for um, 15, 16 years and dealt with a lot of engineering reports and I totally understand best practices and uh, taking engineers advice and guidance 99% uh, of the time. Um, there are times uh, where you do find the perfect storm um, of circumstances that just um, that come together that, that you just can't possibly follow the engineer's recommendations. I see it in the trade quite often and you wanna be able to say to the engineer, but what if, and uh, you don't always have the opportunity, but I do think that this is one of those times that I don't think it's 100% pedestrian, pedestrian driven. It's a weird road layout. There's a strange parking lot you can pull out of the traffic coming off of Bayshore. Um, it's, a, it's a strange intersection. And I think um, the fact that we haven't had enough accidents there isn't justification to not do this. Um, I think it's adding more safety. Um, I've seen some videos posted online this week of people just blowing through uh, the new stop signs. So I think um, by adding more stop signs, if there is an issue, people are, you know, in that Canadian standoff where it's, you know, you go first, you go first, is it me, is it you, uh, which is a much better problem to have than people blowing through stop signs and accidentally maybe uh, striking a pedestrian or another vehicle. Uh, hopefully, if there is an accident there, it's low speed, uh, low impact. Um, from what I heard, um, the standards um, were erring on the side of safety, unless I heard something wrong. Or there's another hypothetical you can think of. I'm trying to you know, take something off the top of my mind where we've added a stop sign and now created another um, a source of danger. I, I can't wrap my head around that personally, but I, I, I do intend on supporting this motion. Uh, I've certainly heard some passionate um, conversations from some downtown store owners and some downtown uh, regulars. So um, it is my intent to um, see this as the perfect storm and uh, go against engineering recommendations for probably my first time in eight years in, in council. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, I just wanted to, to point out, Councillor Shevsky mentioned that uh, some people are blowing the stop signs. That's the challenge. And when they blow a, a stop sign and an accident occurs because we've implemented a four-way stop that maybe shouldn't be there, we are now given liability because the somebody will argue, you know, had, had it been designed properly, that accident might not have occurred when the person blew the stop sign. And that's the, that's the argument that happens in court. Um, it's, it's because we didn't do something right and an accident occurs. So all I'm bringing up is, yeah, as I said, you have your choice, uh, but there is liability. And as I said, we're in the courts right now on a decision that council made in 2014 on a pedestrian crossing. Uh, if you if I if you really want my opinion, I'd say we should wait till we see the outcome of that court case to see how we like that decision. But uh, you know, I don't know how long that's that's going to take to go through the process. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Councilor Main. Uh, thank you. I'll I'll be brief. Um, as I spoke uh, previously when this came forward, um, I'm I definitely would support a four-way stop sign at this intersection. Um, again, a 
I don't think that this is driven by the pedestrians in the area. I think this is definitely triggered uh, because of the dynamic downtown nature of this intersection. Uh, just because Bay and Bayshore is weird, you know, and but it also is a downtown uh, street. So it's not necessarily First Street has uh, the greater number of traffic to, uh, you know, warrant the two way in the one direction. So again, four way stop sign is, uh, for me at least, is a start. Um, when you see policies in our official plan talking about complete streets, this is a perfect example because this is a very old fashioned extra wide uh, road for pedestrians to cross from one side to the other. They're almost crossing four lanes, although it's two lanes from curb to curb, it almost ends up as four lanes. And so complete street solutions. And if you see all this stuff around vision zero, uh, which is trying to move away from thinking of road accidents as collisions, and it's not an accident, it's somebody you know, had the decision that they steered their car in the in that direction, but they sh uh, shorten uh, turning radiuses as we've done on King Street. Uh, add lots of uh, paint delineation so pedestrians are here uh, and people know uh, where to turn. So I think a stop sign is the first step, but I, I certainly would love to see more uh, complete street uh, solutions at this intersection. Um, we'll have some rainbow crosswalks. We can put some lots more white paint down. Um, but yeah, I, I support that moving forward. Uh, I support this motion um, just because of the dynamic situation. It, for me, again, it's not trying to trump pedestrians over vehicles. It's you got taxis, you got trucks, you got downtown delivery trucks coming at it this, this way and that way. So for me, I, I again would say it's about controlling the turning movements at that intersection. Um, so I would, I would say four way stop sign works for me. Thank you. Councillor, Councillor Donner, did I see your hand? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. If you, if you hit the space bar, I think that'll release mute. No. Hold space bar down. There you go. Yep. Hold it down. Yeah, good. No, I'm sorry. I can't support a four-way stop here. I'd have to uh, listen to our engineer. They're the experts, and uh, I've I've been in a few court cases that haven't worked out so well in my years on council, and I think we're uh, we're asking for trouble if we go with a four-way stop here. That that's my opinion. Thank you, councillor. Um, just like to come make a comment if I can, uh, if you will indulge me. Um, we've heard from engineering that none of the criteria that would call for a four way stop according to provincial regulations apply. None of them. We also know that we are not currently engaged in a court case where a pedestrian is suggesting that we have not followed the recommendations appropriately to protect that pedestrian as laid out in the provincial regulations. And according to Councillor McGinn, she'd like to know who to talk to. Well, that's the province, if you want to see that changed. Um, I watched the video uh, that um, Mr. Campbell took from Ms. Roof. It was very interesting. Yes, there were people who were you know, violating uh, just about every, every rule you could have around, whether it was a two-way stop or a four-way stop, it didn't matter. Um, but what I noticed more than anything, and Mr. Campbell brought it up, was that pedestrians on that intersection seemed to have a death wish because they were blowing the rules out everywhere. There was vi pedestrian violation. It wouldn't matter what you put in there. People were behaving like lunatics on that particular weekend. Now, I don't know whether that happens all the time, but uh, I, frankly, um, somebody, if they keep that up, will get hurt. Stop signs or no stop signs. As far as um, I've driven, like Councillor Prost, I've driven that intersection, I made a point of doing it. And initially, because I was driving out of habit and thinking about other things, I actually almost went through the intersection and, an act, and, and crazier yet, I actually stopped when I didn't have a stop sign because I was used to doing it. People acclimate to what they see and what the stimulus are in front of them and they adapt over time. And really, there hasn't been a lot of time for people to adapt. There's been a lot of talk about how well people can't adapt and so on, but people do. 
Um, yes, liability is a fact. And liability is, you can call it a bugaboo, you can call it what you want, but it is bankrupting municipalities. There are municipalities who cannot get insurance anymore because they've had so many suits for ignoring things like this and other things. Uh, our insurance companies, will, well, they'll touch them, but they can't afford it. And uh, I think as, as Councillor Downer, we ignore the, the things brought down by the province to regulate movement around intersections for both vehicles and pedestrians. We are asking to get hurt financially. And so I can't support this motion. I would be very interested in Mr. Campbell's suggestion about a regulated crosswalk. But what I've seen about behaviors so far in that video from Mr. Campbell, I don't think that would do any good either. And the other thing is, uh, I would just point out too, around stop sign behavior on a four-way stop. Nobody has a clue what to do. And I, 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 I posited that question to Inspector Evans when we were out for a drive. And I said, I asked him, I said, is it not true that the person who arrives at the intersection who's sitting there on the right has a right of way on a faraway stop? He said, yes. And I said, well, why does everybody sit around doing it after you, Alphonse, uh, when they come to a faraway stop? He said, I have no idea. They don't seem to understand the traffic regulations. And people have to take responsibility when they get in a vehicle for how they operate that vehicle and their understanding of what their, their obligations and the rules say about how you conduct yourself. So that the pedestrian, you, know, you do have a pedestrian friendly community. And I would very much uh, endorse what Councillor Main said about as we redo streets, we look to make them pedestrian friendly by the, just exactly what we did on King Street. That is a, a pedestrian friendly uh, setup. And yet still, still I see people crossing the street not at crosswalks or anything else, they just jaywalk. I mean, that's just people. Um, and so they do so at their peril, but for, we've slowed traffic down to the point now where they can get a, likely get away with it. And people are actually courteous. You know, People actually will stop and wave somebody across. Um, so I'm not gonna support, I can't support this. And I'm gonna ask for a, a recorded vote on this because I firmly believe that if this council puts in the four way stops, you're asking for significant liabilities and it will come back to buy this as Councillor Downer said. Councillor Gordon, last segment, last two. Yes, year. sorry, just a quickie. You brought up OPP and it just, it uh, reminded me that I'm under the impression that the OPP actually sent a letter supporting this request or something like that into the town, but it was never, I didn't see it on the CIP or it wasn't circulated to council. And I would love to know the content if someone could read out that letter uh, before we do the vote here. If assuming this letter in fact exists, apparently it was addressed to Mr. Campbell and perhaps yourself, your worship. I didn't see a letter from the OPP, Mr. Campbell. No. I have not received a letter. So there you go. All right, fair enough. That's that's rumors for you, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, let's let her rip that. You know, I'll clarify just a little bit. After the very first day, uh, the OPP said, you know, there was confusion that very first day. So there's a very, you know, one line email, two line email uh, on that very first day. But since then, there's been, um, you know, no communication from OPP as to any problems. And I have not received a, a letter. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Gordon. So just before I call the vote, I, I have an administrative uh, faux pas here. Who seconded this? This motion by Councillor Gordon. Probst. Councillor Probst. Thank you very much. So Madam Clerk, uh, can we have a recorded vote on? Um, Your, Your Worship, can I get one quick question for Mr. Campbell before we vote? Sure. Um, there was questions around Midland Avenue and, and Bay, and that's a four-way stop sign in close proximity to Bay Shore. Uh, it's a little further than, I think you said, 37 meters. Just curious your thoughts on that intersection, because that was compared to this uh, intersection. Thank you. Mr. Campbell. Uh, through your worship to Councillor uh, Main, yes, there are other intersections and staff may be bringing reports to 
as we have done every year since I've been here, we've been reports taking out uh, yield signs, putting in stop signs, changing speed limits. And there are other, uh, on, on Midland Avenue and on First Street, there are intersections uh, with signage that don't meet best practices and staff may be bringing those forward to correct those also. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you um, call a recorded vote, please? Yes, I can. Thank you, Mayor Strathern. And Council, you've heard the question. When I call out your name, please answer yes or no. Councillor Prost? Yes. Councillor Cunningham? No. Councillor McGinn? Yes. Councillor Oshevsky? Yes. Councillor Gordon? Yes. Councillor Downer? No. Councillor Main? Yes. And Mayor Strathern? No. The motion is carried five to three. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So next, uh, so next item 16, uh, 17 rather, confirmatory bylaw. Moved by Councillor Prost and seconded by Councillor McGinn that bylaw 2021-39 being a bylaw to adopt the proceedings of the regular council meeting held August 18th, 2021, be passed and enacted. Uh, Council, you've heard the motion. Comments or questions with respect to the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Thank you. That carries. And uh, moved by Councilor Main, seconded by Councilor Gordon, that this regular meeting of Council adjourn at, just get my watch in the right place, 8.51. Uh, all in favor? Thank you. Well, it's been an interesting evening, Council. Thanks. Uh, challenging, uh, challenging to say the least, uh, certain, all perspectives, but um, a good discussion.